morning, everyone, and you're very welcome to Smock Alley for another Friday Forum. And this one is as part of the First Fortnight Festival. My name is Maria Fleming. I'm the CEO of First Fortnight, and we're Ireland's mental health arts charity and festival. And we work to eliminate the stigma attached to mental health. And we've partnered on two Friday forums with the wonderful Peter Gowan. And thank you for partnering with us, Peter. And Peter's production, The Chronicles of Ogle, is playing here in Smock Alley as part of First Fortnight. If you haven't seen it, what were you thinking? Why haven't you been in yet? Please do come in. You have three more opportunities to see it. It's such a beautiful production. Uh, we also have a number of other events across this weekend. Um, they're all available on firstfortnight.ie, including Cloud Study, which is playing here also in Smock Alley. And it's been really wonderful to have a few in-person events where we've gathered in foyers and in theatres uh, the way we love to, but we also have a lot of events online, so check that out. Um, we're delighted to uh, partner for this event, and uh, with First Fortnight, we partner with an organisation, Sea Change, and I'm delighted to have Barbara from Sea Change with us today. I'll let Barbara introduce her organisation and why she's here, and my wonderful colleague Patricia Burke, uh, who is the services manager uh, in First Fortnight, is here representing us. And thank you, May, for facilitating today, and Peter is here as well with us. So I'll hand over to the panel. Please do check out firstfortnight.ie, and thank you for being here today. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, my name is Maeve Lambert. I'm going to be chairing today. Um, and I just want to start by um, thanking the Arts Council and the Irish Theatre Institute, um, which is funded through the Accelerate programme. Or it's, sorry, the Irish Theatre Institute. Yeah, through the Accelerate programme. Through the Accelerate programme. Programme. Funded, funded by, by Rethink, Rethink Ireland. And thanks a million to First Fortnight for having us here. So um, I, um, I'm just going to, how, how we're going to work this is I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves briefly, what they do, um, and maybe a little bit about your organisations. And then we're going to just um, have a quite an open conversation about how we portray mental illness on stage and screen in a kind of a useful, productive, ethical manner that is, you know, helpful to everybody and serves everybody appropriately and well. Um, so yeah, maybe we start with you, Patricia. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Patricia Burke. I work with First Fortnight. I'm the Therapeutic Services Manager, but I suppose I come with a very eclectic hat on me. Um, I originally started off way back as an electrician in DSB at a time when there weren't women, yes. Uh, a wonderful experience, and I learned quite a lot. The biggest, the biggest thing I learned was how to work with men, and knowing that there is a different energy, which is actually wonderful. That's probably the biggest experience piece I got in that time, apart from obviously the skills. And I then worked in uh, Intel, uh, and worked in Israel with them. I worked in India for a while um, uh, as a volunteer, and uh, set up groups, etc., out there. Um, came back and um, I've, I worked in uh, with Dublin City Council for 19 years, actually 23 years in total, working in housing, homelessness, but I started off as a community warden with senior citizens. So I've had, I suppose, the reason why I say all of that, and actually now what I do, I'm actually a, a psychotherapist, I trained as a therapist. I did that because when I was working as a, as a community warden, I was finding people who were struggling, and I was finding myself um, needing to be more skilled because one minute I was trying to get them support, next minute I was with them when they were dying, next minute I was, you know, arguing with services to get services for them. So there was all of that tranche of stuff going on. So I needed to get more skilled. And I, if I wanted to stay the long haul, I really needed to be better skilled. So that's why I did that. I have a passion for music. I do some singing in my own time. So I have a hint of what it's like to be performing. Uh, I really admire actors because I think you are, it's a very vulnerable place to be in. So I really admire what they do. And then I suppose I, um, I've worked as a psychotherapist and moved on to do um, music therapy. And I am now a trauma specialist, so I specialize in trauma. I've worked quite a lot with Beth Rothschild, 
who is a world-renowned figure for um, trauma. So I've traveled the world with her. And uh, so that's what I bring to the role I'm in now, which is in First Fortnight. I manage the uh, services for adults and for children who are homeless or at risk. So we have, we have a service uh, for adults, and we also have four and now five services for children. So it's in different things like domestic violence, we work in uh, direct provision with, with IPAS, that, that side of things, and we work in at-risk schools, etc. So that's just a whistle-stop tour of where I've come from. Amazing, Brilliant. thank you very much. <laughs> I'm 150. <laughs> <laughs> thank Amazing, you. thank you, Patricia. Um, Barbara. Um, so, hi, and I'm delighted to be here in person as well. How very exciting for us all. <laughs> and um, it's really my privilege to have conversations about mental health. So, um, I run Sea Change, it's the National Stigma Reduction Programme in Ireland, and we are a project of Shine. So, Shine is an organisation that supports people affected by mental ill health. And when we say that, what, what we're talking about is people who experience mental health difficulties, but also their families and carers and people just, you know, who engage with them. So, we have a lot of different services. Um, from a perspective of, of why I do what I do and what we actually do, um, I have bipolar disorder myself. Um, I am living well for nearly 14 years now and I have the experience of surviving suicide and that was what brought me to have conversations about mental health. Um, I am a previous Shine service user, so back in the 90s I would have accessed the services of Shine, so things like counselling, things like working out how do, what does recovery mean, what is that, how do I use those services. Um, and I started, I started started to wonder about why people don't get better and why we don't have conversations about that after I survived suicide. So I was on life support for a week and after that I got better. So I never knew the people um, could get better from mental ill health difficulties and um, after having 15 years of severe and complex mental health problems, I did get better. And I got to the point where I did get a job and I did buy a house and I did do all the normal things that people told me I wouldn't be able to do and I now run a programme that talks about mental health. So what we do in Sea Change is we empower people to have conversations. So we look at why people don't talk about mental health and really we look at the fact that stigma is still around. So we are afraid to have conversations about mental health. We're afraid to talk about our own mental health. What I have seen since I started working with Shine and Sea Change in the last 10 years is that we've moved a little bit in that we're now having conversations about mental health and that's why it's wonderful to partner with First Fortnight and talk about it in a different way and normalise it. But what we're still seeing is that we're talking about the out there, that it's somebody else's mental health, it's something we saw on TV. We're still not understanding that all of the things that we see on TV or read you know, on the internet maybe isn't real. And that's where we empower people to have different conversations. So my journey with Sea Change started as an ambassador and that's somebody with lived experiences who share their stories with the idea of trying to change minds about mental ill health and really understand that it, it is possible to get better, but it's also possible to live with the mental health difficulty in a very normal way. So the kind of things that we do is we have a green ribbon campaign. So this is a, a little symbol to say it's okay to have a mental health problem and I'm okay to talk about it. And what we also do is we, we have a workplace programme and we have this ambassador programme that trains people to have those conversations. So um, I feel like I'm kind of really uh, waffling on a little bit, but I hope that today I can give you a little insight into what's it, what it's like from the perspective of that person with lived experience and why it's so important to have that portrayal that we help the public have different conversations about mental health because it's nothing to be afraid of. It's something that we all have. It's something that's very, very normal. And I think when we work better and we have conversations about what we do, that impact can change. So that's that's what, what we do anyway. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. Really appreciate that. Um, and uh, just quickly move on to Peter. Um, and I feel like we're going to... So much to unpack in what you've said, Barbara. I'm itching <laughs> to have the conversation now. Um, but uh, Peter, maybe you could introduce yourself and, and name, um, tell us a little bit about um, the Chronicles of Ogle. I and, will, and yeah. Where coming from. My name is Peter Gowan. I'm an actor and a writer, and I've set up Fight to Flight Theatre, which is the resident theatre company. We're residents, artists in residence here for the past 12 months from uh, the August, for a 12-month period from August. Um, I went to a Christian Brothers School, uh, which was incredibly violent, um, 
And it was only really when I, I got cancer about in 2018 and through the process of going the post-traumatic kind of uh, um, um, therapy that I kind of discovered that, uh, that I'd actually been suffering from anxiety for my whole life and it was a huge impediment. Um, and that anxiety came from my default position as a child was I'm going to get my head knocked off today and I have to fight this. So I kind of fought cancer and I thought that I beat cancer and then I was having nightmares and then we discovered actually you can't, it doesn't work, you, can't, you cannot go through your life with your fists clenched. So the Chronicles of Ogle was an attempt to try to understand why is it that as a small boy I was allowed to uh, society allowed people of that size to be beaten up by men, and that's what happened for the entire time I was at school. And so the Chronicles of Ogle is an attempt to demonstrate, uh, first of all, what it was like. There's an actual scene in the play where, where I, I relive the beatings that we used to get um, because I wanted to show that. And also it's kind of therapeutic for me. But also I wanted to, to ask the question, why is it that Irish society did nothing? Everybody knew that this was happening in the schools. And there's a side story in Ogle as well where uh, a, a man commits suicide in his 40s having been sexually abused. This is an actual story uh, about a guy that I knew. And then I've just heard recently from, uh, from somebody who came to see the show, my, my niece's uh, boyfriend, said that five people in his school, he's only 23, were sexually abused and killed themselves in the last three or four years. And these are people under the age of 25, Catholic school. And, and so it's about that, but also it's a portrait of uh, how somebody overcomes tremendous difficulty themselves and tries to kind of evaluate and kind of uh, reconcile all these kind of societal deficits. Um, and, um, and so it encouraged me to write. So, it's a, so Ogle came out of me trying to work out wh why this was happening and tell this story. So, um, you know, and so I, I, and I wanted the conversation. I think that the, to me, theatre is a conversation and it's got to continue afterwards. And, you know, Ogle, is just the start of, of my conversation with uh, about this issue. And I know there's been a lot written about it, and I know there's been f a huge amount of attention given to it, but it's still going on. And I think there's still a stigma around um, suicide, and there's a stigma around abuse, and people hide it away. They don't really want to talk about it. And I just think it, we need to. And, and also, Ogle is funny, and it's a piece of art, but it does have this agenda underneath it. Uh, and and, that, and that's it, and that's why I'm doing it, and that's why I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a million. I, I should say also that I'm um, a theatre artist myself. Um, I've been working in the field of uh, inclusive uh, theatre practice for the last 16 years. Um, and my, my own practice is really about the idea of kind of paying attention and um, making sure that people feel and are included in, you know, if in terms of visibility and, and, you know, if we're not seeing people who look like us or talk like us on stage, then how do we know that we can be okay or do that? Or so it's around the importance of representation. Um, so I also worked on the Chronicles of Ogle with Peter from quite an early stage, yeah. actually. Um, so my eldest daughter is nearly 11. So I was pregnant with Chloe yeah, when we started working together. That was a while ago. Working so remember your husband this. singing to her, to yeah. her in your belly. <laughs> 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 so, we, so, I mean, that was something that was really on your mind from the very beginning of writing this, that you, you, know, you really wanted people to have these conversations. That was kind of top of your list, yeah. was to have this conversation. Um, so I, I, I like there's a couple of things that I really want to focus on. One is around language um, and how the language of, of how we talk about mental health or mental illness or, or mental well-being. Um, and the other thing that I really want to talk about is what is a good process of, of making a piece of art that is centered around mental illness look like? Um, I suppose uh, at the moment um, we're really conscious that uh, there's a storyline in Fair City, um, which I haven't seen, I, I really must confess, um, that is uh, causing some upset and controversy um, because of how it portrays psychosis, am I right, or, or what they're calling psychosis but um, possibly isn't. Um, and maybe that is like a, an interesting starting point in that that, that may be a bad example. So what does a good example look like and how does it begin? 
Um, I'm just going to open it up. Does somebody want to start? I, I might jump in from a, from um, a dual perspective, um, and I suppose to, to say, you know, if, if Shine is our overarching organisation, we've got Headline and we've got Sea Change. So Headline is an organisation that supports uh, the media on responsible reporting and. Um, also does education. So one of the things is, you know, you mentioned about the process. It's about looking at what's the impact of what we're saying and why, um, and particularly the triggering pieces. So it's, you know, it's about if we're portraying suicide, for example, is there anything, is there information in that that's going to be triggering to other people? Um, is it factual? And even if it is factual, where where is the line between being factual and being triggering? Um, I think when we're talking about different um, particular shows or different things, it's important to note that just because they've done something once doesn't mean they always do it. So I know historically, uh, Fair City particularly did work with people who experienced mental health difficulties previously, <coughs> and those storylines did work really, really well. But um, my understanding on this particular one is that they didn't have that same interaction with people with lived experience, and it was very sensational. So when we're talking about stigma, we talk about that sensational piece, and we talk about the stereotypes. So it was this idea that this this psycho is, is, is murdering people. And that's the thing that we really want to avoid because first of all not everybody who experiences a mental health difficulty experiences the same things and for the majority of people which actually is probably a higher number than we than we understand experience mental health difficulties but aren't violent and actually people who experience mental health difficulties are quite often the um, the victims of violence so so that stereotypical piece is really important to avoid um, so when we're talking about that process then it's about looking at how do we involve that voice and what does it really look like? So, for example, Headline have done a lot of research around um, the, the safeguarding of those conversations, so the, the, um, the piece around being responsible and not re-traumatising people, and, and the responsible piece about how do, we, how do we actively do this, so to your point, that we don't say, well, we can't talk about that. It's not about saying we can't talk about it, it's about saying, okay, so how do we? And then it's also about saying, well, if we're going to portray a person with a mental illness who is experiencing a psychotic break or is experiencing a, a strong episode, that's absolutely okay, but we need to understand what that's like for that person yeah. and, and deal with it from their perspective. So that's really engaging with people with lived experience. So maybe coming to a group like uh, shine and sea change and saying you have people who are trained in this area who know how to have responsible conversations who know not to trigger who know how to tell their story in a reasonable way and share symptoms without you know being worried about copycatting or or upsetting people because here's the other thing from a point of view of the impact when somebody sees a storyline and they say i don't identify with that and actually not only do i not identify with that I now don't want to tell people that I have X, Y, or Z. So, for example, if we go back last year, um, there was a lady who, who unfortunately um, murdered her children. And that was absolutely heartbreaking. And I have the same disorder as that lady has. And for me, I'm, if you like, out and proud, everybody knows it. But for lots of people I know who have that disorder, they were saying, I can't. I can't let somebody know that I have that illness because they'll think I'm dangerous. They might try and take my children away from me. And these are the things that we need to be really mindful of when we have a conversation about mental illness and mental health difficulties, the impact on the people who also have that diagnosis. And then there's the other side around the general public, that if they haven't experienced a mental health difficulty or they don't have a member of their family or a close friend, so they don't know what it looks like, because it's, always, it's, not, it's not just me. My family have experienced bipolar disorder through my lens. So it's about the general public who haven't had those experiences that they're seeing that. So when we have an opportunity to portray a mental illness, it's about the responsibility of having a... a a realistic conversation, but also shifting things to say, yes, maybe sometimes there may be the odd occasion that somebody does become violent, and maybe they happen to have a mental illness, and that could be an isolated thing, but it does not mean that everybody who has this disorder also is violent and will do this or that. So it's about how we navigate those things and understanding that there's lots of different options open to us and what we do to portray it, and then including those voices of lived experience, I think will give us those nuances about, well, you know, this particular disorder might mean X, Y, and Z, but actually 
I've never experienced those myself. So, you know, each person is individual. So I guarantee you, if you rounded up all the people in the world who have <laughs> bipolar disorder, for example, I have bipolar one, which is um, a more extreme version. So even if we took that section, I guarantee you that not two of us would have had exactly the same experience or the same re um, responses to treatments or different things because we're all individual. So I think even when we work with somebody, it's important to understand that this is their experience and their experience alone, that it maybe is about getting collective experiences. So that collaborative piece, um, and, and um, like you guys were saying about the conversations you were having way, way back, that it's not about having a tokenistic approach and saying, well, we've written this story and now we've got this person with lived experience, we're going to shove them in at the end, you know, so that we can tick that box. It isn't that. It's about really engaging from the get-go to understand that. Um, and uh, tell me, <laughs> I suppose this actually immediately brings us into language because how do, how do you go about finding that per Like, you know, <laughs> say you want to cast somebody with lived experience, for example, you know, how do we talk about that? How, where, do you, where do you go? Like, can you go to a casting agent and say, <laughs> here's my brief, I would like somebody with lived experience of bipolar disorder. Um, or, you know, how do, how do we start as artists? What does that even, on a really basic level, what does it look like? Well, I, I don't know. I think it's very tricky, actually. I mean, and it also could be seen as a kind of trend in casting that if you want a one-eyed Cuban, um, you know, um, flamenco dancer who has only got has got six fingers on her left hand, they'll actually cast this person. They'll go to Cuba and find the person. So I, th I, I'm not, I think that's a bit of a kind of a cul-de-sac, really. I think really where the responsibility lies that if you are portraying mental illness on stage, what you need to do is to have to speak to somebody who's had that experience and then to speak to a professional a practitioner who can then advise you. Like one of the experiences we had, which was very interesting, was do, doing The Plough and the Stars back in 1995 with Joe Dowling that went toured England and went to the West End. He, we had a, a psychiatrist come in and talk about Nora's um, behaviour. And he, he was able to identify what the illness was mm -hmm. and why her behaviours were like that. She was, I think she was, he said she was bipolar, but she was very controlled. She, she managed her disease by controlling her husband. And then when he goes off to join the kind of rising, she loses it. And then when she's having this episode in Act 4, she's not doolally, she's just kind of had a breakdown. Um, and he was able to understand that. And that was a very good indication of how it works well when you get an expert in to talk. And so, they, so you explain it. So you're not going, oh, how do we approach this, um, you know, sensitively. I, I think what you need to do is approach it professionally. And I think it's all about knowledge. And this is about, I mean, I think, I think it's all about knowledge sharing, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but it has to be done responsibly from that point of view. And I don't think we can second guess what the audience is going to like or dislike or who we're going to upset. We can't really approach art like that. You have to go out and be true to the story and then manage it uh, and, and make sure that everything chimes um, truthfully. And then just and then take the flack if somebody comes and say that was really offensive. You have to go, well, you know, I'm, I, I apologise if I have upset you, but, but that's my story. Mm. So. But also to be able to show this is the process. This is yeah. why we did it, and this is who engaged with us on it. Because I think, mm. like that, we've had, um, let's say, a complaint has been made about an article or something um, in the media, and uh, somebody has kind of said, well, I disagree with that, or I don't like that word being used. And then it's explained, well, this is that person's experience, and this mm. is why we've done it in this way, and you're absolutely entitled to have your own opinion. You know, this is about, and I love what you said about maybe putting that discomfort out there, because this is the thing that until we get uncomfortable, comfortable about talking about mental health, we're never going to change things. And it's one of the things that I learned very, very early on in, in my uh, new life, as I call it. Um, I became a sea change facilitator in the workplace programme. And at the beginning, I was very much, um, I'm very grateful to be in this space and thank you. And, you know, I didn't want to upset anybody. And then there was a man in one of our workshops who basically turned around and kind of said, oh, well, if anybody, if anybody came into my work, on my team, came into work um, and were going on about mental health and, and were holding up the team and all the rest of it, well, they just have to get over it. And I remember something in me just went, you, sir, are the reason why I do my job, because that is stigma and that is the thing that we need mm. to change. And from then on, I understood that my role and my job in life and my passion and my purpose became to be a disruptor. 
that I'm not here to make you comfortable about saying things and make it okay for people to say the wrong thing or for people to treat people differently. And back to that point about language, when we say different things about mental health and we use language that doesn't really mean very much to us or we put words out there and we just we just say it and sure well, like what's the big deal and why are people getting offended and you know who cares the thing is for that person who is living that difficulty who has been stigmatized who has been treated less than who has been treated differently who has been refused access who is being refused support who has lost jobs who has lost friends and the list goes on for that person, that word means that you are not a safe person. It means that they can't have a conversation. It means that they feel less than in your eyes. And that's the bit. And all it is is that one teeny tiny word. And I think that's the power that we have about our own conversations. Even if we don't know the bigger conversation, how we can say it, we can change individual words. So we were talking earlier about the whole piece around suicide and how important it is that we have these conversations. One of the most simple ways that we can change our conversation is by not saying he committed suicide, she committed suicide. You know, it's not, it's not against the law anymore. It's not against God. And the thing is that that stigmatizes not just the person who ended up taking their life for whatever reasons they had, it also stigmatizes their family. And the thing is that when we say committed, it's over there. Mm. When we say that person took their life now we're talking about a human being. That is uncomfortable. We don't want to say that because it hurts us. It's mm. sad, it's difficult, it's, it's a failing of, on human society that what did we do wrong that that person felt they couldn't go on anymore. So some of the language is around our own discomfort. And this is the other thing when we're talking about mental health difficulties for the person who's experiencing it, the discomfort is actually yours and not theirs because they've been living with it for such a long time. They've already gone through all of these things. So it sometimes is about having that conversation and asking and saying, well, what words should I use instead? Or what would be comfortable for you? You know, and, and working out. And then when you make a decision like that, maybe to make something uncomfortable, to say, well, here's the decision that we made, but here's all the background, and this is why we did it, because we want to push it, we want to make change. Um, just to your point as well about where you can go to get information, it is about linking in maybe with mental health organisations. So yeah. again, the like of Shine, we have a lot of different people who have lived experience of mental health difficulties. And as I say, through Sea Change, we train ambassadors to share their stories and they are delighted to work with people to broaden that conversation about mental health. So whether it's that you go to Shine or whether it's that you go to other organisations that work with people with mental ill health, whether it's professionals that you go to, it is about having those conversations and understanding things in a different way. It's not about, well, I need to know every single thing on this list now and every single um, movement that the person's going to make. It's a broader understanding and that's all we can do. Yeah, and that's... Yeah, and that is a really valid point to like, firstly, we need to be looking at going to approaching an organisation and professionals as opposed to like Johnny down the road, who I know isn't well. Um, so that's really important. And the other is that we're, um, I suppose we need to, like, am I right in saying that we need to be thinking more about the, a, a kind of collective as opposed to an individual that we're, we're not like imitating or we're not like pretending to be that we're trying to get as much information about <laughs> about something that we want to talk about from, you know, a, a varied amount of people. I think, I think if we, we um, personalise it too much, it becomes about one person. Yeah. And then we end up generalising based on one person. I think totally agree with you. No two people are the same. We have a tendency to believe because someone has symptoms. We can all have similar symptoms, but we all have different backgrounds. We have different adversities. We have different health. We have different networks. Some people have great networks, others have none. And I think that's. I think we need to get to a stage where we start humanising people again, where we take the using and theming. You know, we all have mental health. I think you put it so beautifully. I almost feel I have nothing to say <laughs> because everything I wanted to say you've said it. But it's wonderful. It's 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 the normalising. It's actually balancing. It's seeing people as more than what's happened to them. And I think with adversity. I, I mean, I've worked in homelessness for about 19 years at this stage. And in, in all of that time, I've never been, uh, I've never, I'm always shocked at the amount of resilience and determination that people have in spite of huge adversity. I mean, there's huge studies out there, like Vincent Felitti has done studies on ACEs. And looking at adversity, we can be doing, we can be looking at film, 
um, uh, all sorts of different uh, adaptations, looking at how, um, if you have the right um, circumstances around you, how you can actually avoid. So be a bit more preventative rather than always looking at what's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Looking at what support systems are out there. What can actually empower, you know, and I think sometimes we get, we go down a rabbit hole with looking at what's wrong with someone. And people are much more than what's happened. They, they have good days as well as bad days. We all have it. And I think I, I, would, I would never sit on my ivory tower and say that, well, I'm lucky and it's them, they've got a problem. Actually, I'm lucky that I have people and networks around me, but I've worked with so many people who, who have not had the privilege of having maybe a stable background, having a stable home. You know, I've worked with people who've come from abroad who have the added stigma of being from a different country. I mean, we don't even, it's similar to, I mean, I, I was brought up in Ballymun and it was, you didn't tell anyone you were from there. Because if you told anyone you were from there, you wouldn't get a job. It's the same thing with mental health. It's a bit like, don't tell them you have that. If you tell them that, then you're, you won't get a job or they'll actually think you're dangerous mm -hmm. or they'll think you're going to be off work all the time. So I suppose, to me, I'm very passionate about people. And I, I think we need to go beyond looking at the labels. I think when you, when you say you're schizophrenic, that's one of the language issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, start, uh, we start associating people with the label. You're much more. That's, that's just a name that puts with either funding, you get funding to support people in different categories. That's where it should lie. But it would be like if we turned around and said, I am COVID. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, we don't say, I am heart attack, I am cancer, I am whatever. <coughs> and just when we think about mental illness, I am depressed. Actually, for the most part, depression is a behaviour or a feeling. So I feel it. Or maybe I have it. And it's one of the things that when I went... So I went from... Um, mm -hmm being depressed um, at the age of 14 after my first suicide attempt to then being bipolar um, in my 20s, you know, to then learning, actually, I am not that. And to your point earlier that you were saying that we're so much more than that, you know, and it was only then that I started going, this is not me, because all my life I learned how to be that. And I think that's the bit that we really, really need to be mindful of no matter where we are, and it doesn't really matter whether it's mental ill health that we're talking about or any other illness, that when a person is going through it and it's, it's that heightened period, for somebody that heightened period, like for me it was 15 years. Mm. So I was that, but I wasn't. It was that, you know, I had this underlying life that got put on the side and to your point that when we focus on illness, that's the bit. So my whole life I learned how to, you know, did I, did I sleep enough last night? Did I eat enough? Did I, you know, um, how much was I worrying? Did I, did I, was I, if I was happy, was I too happy? If I was sad, was I too sad? All of that. But I had to relearn that I am a friend, I'm a sister, I'm an artist, I'm a daughter, I'm, I'm also a work colleague now. Like I do all of these things and it's about you to You are sum a potential. Me. Exactly. Lots of things. Exactly. And I think that's the thing for anybody who has experienced a mental health difficulty. And to be very clear, we all have mental health. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really rude, actually, and ask, um, has anybody ever been happy? If you put your hand up for me, have you ever been happy before in your life? Doesn't matter how long or for what. OK. Um, what about sad? Doesn't matter how, how sad, what level or how long for. OK, sad. OK, so what about worried? Have you ever been worried about everything, anything? OK, OK. So um, what about angry? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we've just experienced is that we all have mental health because we all experience those different ways of feeling and those different emotions and particularly the worry one is interesting because so um, when we think about how we worry it impacts our actions and our physiological behaviour and this is the thing when we think about mental health we jump to mental illness mm. and when we jump to mental illness we also jump to person drooling in the corner who's been hospitalised or who is at home who hasn't worked for 10 years and is on medication that isn't true and for the majority of people that we know we all have mental health, which means we all have mental health difficulties. And here's the thing, to your point earlier, the people can and do get better. I never knew that I would get better. I never knew that it was a chance. I never knew that it was possible. And that's why conversations like this are so important that we can portray that even in those really awful stages, you know, like to get to a point where you're on 48 tablets a day and you end up on a machine, it doesn't get much worse than that. And yet, my life is so different now. And that's the thing that even when we're portraying this really difficult scenario or maybe, you know, in, in Fair City, maybe that scenario did happen somewhere in the world. 
but it doesn't mean that that person is that or that they can't be any different than that. And I think that's the bit that we need to be mindful of, that piece of okay. inclusion and the background and all of the things that have led this person to this point. And that leads me to the bit of, am I cured or am I just preventing it? Either way, I don't care. As long as I do those things to keep me well, then I am well. And I think that's the bit that we need to understand. We need to help other people to see that no matter whether they are the person with lived experience, whether they're the, the person, the family member who's around them, or whether they're the person who has never had an experience of mental health through their own piece, or they, you know, they don't support somebody, that we help them to understand it. Mm. And that's the bit, you know, when we're portraying mental illness, that we have that possibility and that, that chance. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to open um, up for it to the audience for questions in a minute. I just wanted to kind of, it's sort of a question, I guess. It's just, um, so I guess, I think you've just given us all permission. <laughs> in theatre, we tend to make work that is kind of big. Like people are experiencing really big emotions. The stories kind of need to be big because that's what we're, we're doing more than reflecting life. We're kind of amplifying and, and refracting and, you know, illuminating things. Um, or we like to, or we like to think we are. Um, and I think sometimes like we're really afraid of the really big stories. Um, and those are um, moments, I guess, in, you know, when you're, you're saying um, we don't just have to jump to mental illness. But I think generally if we if somebody is unwell on stage, like they're really unwell. So how do we navigate that? Like, how do we negotiate that? Um, I think is but but you've given us permission to try i think am i right <laughs> yeah i think it's i think it's important that we do because it's a fact of life yeah. you know and it's like it's like if we take cancer you know not everybody who experiences cancer you know is is absolutely completely frail and is you know not everybody loses their hair not everybody has this version that we see and yet when we see it portrayed that's what we see yeah so it's you know, <laughs> and, and i think it's it's something that we need to be mindful of that yeah. there's lots well i was of running around the hospital the day after my operation i was going i was I'm, I'm getting better i'm getting better I'm, it's great i'm yeah. delighted i got bowel cancer because it's one of the best ones you can get and i'm delighted my grandchildren <laughs> didn't get it i got it it's brilliant it's brilliant it's brilliant and that's how i approached it and then i would wake up screaming with nightmares and i thought ooh maybe i'm not really i haven't won this battle and and it, and it, and actually it was great to talk to somebody and actually just to unravel stuff and to admit i have suffered from anxiety because of my rather than i i, I they toughened you up the brothers toughened you up no they didn't they destroyed part of of and 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 a potential in me to, to, to be happier. And I was very unhappy for a long time. I was never suicidal, but I used to get these d d depressive episodes. And theatre was a great way of kind of, you know, it was a great way of kind of, uh, it's a great salve in theatre, it's a great support. It's very therapeutic. But then, of course, if you're out of work and you get one of these black kind of things, it was just un unspeakable. I would get up in the morning and just have a cup of tea and at half past nine I would go how am I going to get through this day I, I, don't, I don't think I can do this my agent has to phone something has to happen and I would have to kind of get myself together and just go come on we can do this but that, this is where the writing came in then that, that's when I started and I wrote terrible things terrible plays and stupid they were all but it was just that beginning to kind of heal myself and, and certainly from um, I, I think that a lot of the stuff that I'm writing is about healing it's about and it's about using these experiences and that sense high sensitivity that you have when you're in, when you're vulnerable, you begin to see things in a very clear way, but in a very kind of a sort of a unique way. And it's very useful as a writer then to kind of to have this perspective because people go, they, you can share that with people. Uh, you know, as you talked about refracting. You know, I mean, so so it's um, so so it's, I know this is not about portrayal, but certainly Packy is is uh, somebody who's very odd. And we had this conversation that she said, well, he's, he's kind of, he's autistic or something. And I said, no, he's just been damaged by four years in a reformatory where they were beaten up and they were starved and they were neglected and boys were raped. And he, he as a five-year-old, sees a boy hanging in, in an orchard. And that messes with his head. And he spends his time then when he gets adopted, coming out, trying to reconcile all these things and trying to catch up in the, in the days. He says, I have to learn fast. I have to catch up. He's never had a cone in his life. He's never seen a woman's shoe. 
He sees when he, when he meets, meets his adoptive mother, he, she's got a, a, um, a shoe with a buckle on it. And he goes, I've never seen a shoe like that. Like, what the hell's going on? And he's trying to recover that. So in some ways, that, that it, so my portrayal was, I don't want to have him as a stock kind of mentally ill character or, or an autistic character or as a disabled character. He's traumatized and he's trying to, um, he's trying to kind of overcome his, his disability, I suppose, that, he, that it's accreted to him. But he's doing it with kind of optimism. And he does come out of the end kind of having had a very difficult life on top and it's a kind of an Irish everyman it's supposed to be like represent how Irish people are we're generally very good at getting on with things and getting over things we'll be grand and we'll do it together and it's all fine the, 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 the sort of the, the negative side of that is we ignore an awful lot of complex problems uh, because this is what we, we identify as the, the Irish are great. We all we, we you, you know what I mean. This it's a it's a really simplistic approach to it. But but certainly the play for me is about um, an aspect of being Irish, about the kind of not being able really to deal with emotional issues, not being able to deal with mental health, and but still coming out the other end. But I think what we're talking about now is a new era where we don't have to be. We don't have to have our fists clenched. And I spent, like I'm 63 now, up to the age of 61, I was ready for a fight in a queue, anywhere, always ready. And I didn't even know that. But my response was always, no, you fuck off. And, you know, she's saying, no, but there's actually two queues. That's all she was saying. And I, I, I fucking don't tell me about queues. I know about queues. What's wrong with you? Yeah, how do you confuse an Englishman? Put him into a, a room and tell him to join the queue. Yeah, yeah, you know. I live in England, by the way. Uh, so that was a sort of a very bad joke about English people. Um, but, um, uh, but, but no, but I was ready to fight and, and, and losing that like through this therapy and through these experiences and through theatre, just I'm so much happier. And this is how I created Fight to Flight Theatre. I just thought I can do this now because I'm not filled with anxiety. And I, and I didn't do it. I, I did when I left university and, uh, and then it was 40 year gap. And, uh, and then I started, but I'm, I'm now free of anxiety because of that. And I just think it's just brilliant that the admission to oneself, I have a problem, I am anxious, I'm, not, I'm mentally ill, basically, and I'm being cured. And I continue to talk to this person. I'll speak to him again on Tuesday. Tuesday evening, so we work through. We're going back. I'm going right back to the very, very beginning, and I've opened up rather than saying I'm grand. I'm grand. Sure, it's a load of rubbish. Um, you know. So sorry, I've, I've gone on a little bit, but but no, it, it's it, brilliant because it, it's an yeah. ongoing theme. It seems like we just need to keep talking. Yeah. You know? I think what you're actually trying to say, it, it, it's lovely to listen to you because there is another way. Yeah. And that's really what you're saying by by normalising. We all the, the reality is life is going to throw curveballs at us. If, mm. As I say to people all the time, if I'm lucky enough to live long enough, I'm going to experience an awful lot of things. So with that, you either bite the bullet on it and you say, let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's not pretend that it's OK to have experiences that, that you can't talk about, that we have to silence ourselves. Or that, because the problem is when, you, uh, and when I look at people who are traumatised, uh, it's almost like a pressure cooker. And what you do is you just keep adding more pressure. The more you stigmatise or you, you prejudice people, all you're doing is further isolating. Yeah. And uh, is that going to get rid of the problem? Absolutely not. We've got to use common sense. And to me, sometimes common sense can be missing. And really, it's about simple. It's, it's actually getting back to basics. It's about building networks. It's a building, you know, resilience in children. It's building, it's OK to have a bad day. Yeah. It is OK to have a bad day and to be able to talk about it and it's not a moan. You're not moaning because you're having a hard, hard day. And I think us to be... But the problem is a lot of people... We, have our, and this, we haven't really brought this out I could sp spend for Ireland on this. We have our own biases and prejudices. And I think we've got to be mindful. And I think when it comes to writing plays or whatever, we've got to be also mindful of our own biases. And this is where the intent and what we're putting forward. Yeah. Are we intending on just getting our anger out there uh, at any cost, or are we putting it out? It's a wonderful, you, you've an ex, as, a, as an actor, it's an, you have an exquisite ability to actually have empathy with people. You have to bring yourself to it, but what are you bringing to it? Yeah. Are you bringing only anger that's just wanton anger? Or is yeah. it an anger that actually is a call to action? So there's something about it. What's the call to action you want at the end of it? Is it yeah. that you want everyone annoyed and angry, or do you want people to say, actually, we need to stop this? We need to open the conversation. We need to be able to talk. We need to be able to support those children. We need to be able to find, we need to not be putting it under the carpet when we see something wrong. And that's going yeah. back to the adversity. It's yeah. all down to adversity. So, I mean, I could talk forever on this. No, it but, no but that's fascinating because you were talking about like, you know, is that, it, it, and again, it, it's a really process 
um, process-based thing, that idea, like, is this absolutely necessary for the character to go through? Is it necessary for the story? And is it necessary for what I, what I want to talk about? Like, these are things that we need to think about dramaturgically um, as well, but, but really doing due diligence on, like, is it important to what we're saying? But here's the thing, it's not, unlike singing, because I sing, so it's, it's very much about the vocal, but with acting, it's all the nuances, it's the, it's the pauses, mm. it's, the, it's the what's not said. So you can actually exquisitely bring someone to a point where they might get shocked, mm. but actually it's a gentle shock, mm. rather than just catastrophizing and yeah. actually overwhelming your audience, where if someone gets overwhelmed, one thing that doesn't work is your cognitive function is gone. So if you have any lesson that you want to put out there, nobody's going to get it. Mm. They're going to go away dysregulated all over the place. That's not what you want. No. So you want, you want to bring people exquisitely to that experience and connect with them. Mm-hmm. Well, certainly, I, 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 that's what happens in Ogle, is that he, he, the character is, gets into a very dangerous situation, but then comes out, and so the audience then is primed for it. Any, anything happens to think, oh, no. But then it's, it's a, there's always relief. So it is a bit like going down, slaloming down a ski slope. I mean, that's the only way I, I can describe it, is that you, you, you have the, constantly swerving and missing out on danger. But it's about kind of saying that like, this was a dangerous time. And, and so it's to serve the story and to make it real and to make people like the character. So, I mean, I, I take everything on board. Is that ha- It's very funny, but it's also very sad. So you get very sad moments, and then people can have a good old belly laugh after it. But they walk away with uh, having be- re- received the story in, in, in a kind of responsible way, I think, really. And yeah. humour. And I think that's yeah, one of the beautiful huge. things that the Irish have, mm-hmm. is yeah. humour. Yeah. We're able to laugh at the most mm-hmm. unlaughable things. And, and actually, with mental health, it's one of the things that... I have so many friends that they say I have such a I have such an odd sense of humor and it's because I learned that it's okay to have a sense of humor around mental illness that it's like if I'm experiencing depression that doesn't mean I can't laugh yeah. doesn't mean I can't have fun and actually those are the things we need most so it's like you know if somebody is off work and um, you see them down the cinema well then it's like oh my god like they're off work and they're they're doing what like they can't be doing that but actually maybe that's what they need mm. to normalize and mm. to go and um, give themselves a boost and find that because <coughs> like you say it's this you know because we live on a continuum and and it's like we've all experienced the sitting in traffic and realizing that we're going to be late and then the impact that's going to have or you know getting that email or getting that phone call and having that instant reaction and then the things that follow so it is about having that sense of humor mm. and how we portray that but i loved what you said about the nuances because it really is about that and i I'll be honest and say for a lot of years I stopped watching movies. I I, I don't have a TV in my house. I will put my hands up. Um, but I stopped engaging with the media completely because I found it overwhelming and I also found a lot of the portrayals completely wrong. Mm. But then there was a couple of, of movies I remember and I won't I won't name them, but there were there were a few where a person did take their life in the in the uh, the storyline or they attempted to. And I remember in the lead up to it, I already knew they were going to do it. I already knew, and it was because the nuances were there. It wasn't said, and like that, the people watching the movie with me would be like, how did you know that was creepy? Like, how did you know? And there was a part of me going, whoever wrote that story really spent time on the nuances, Mm. and they obviously spoke to more than one person Mm. about the experience of that, because there there are certain things when you experiencing uh, experience a really negative um, experience that you would do something in a certain way or you'd think in a certain way and the thinking is different. You're primed. It, yeah, you're primed, exactly. But, but the, here's the thing about mental illness. Just because somebody is thinking in a diff- different way doesn't mean it's wrong. Mm. It means we don't understand how they are thinking and they don't understand how we are thinking in that same moment. And I think that's the bit that we need to understand, mm-hmm. that there's no wrong way. It's like there's no wrong emotions. A lot of the time that we, we feel like if I feel low or if I feel angry, that that's bad. It isn't. It's telling us that we're going in the wrong direction, that we need support and help to go go this way. And I think that's the beautiful thing about life, that you know, we have this inner, inner soul or inner peace, and it's always saying, come this way, come this way, come this way. And sometimes we get so used to listening to that, that, that kind of medical aspect and focusing on the Ill- illness that it gets louder. Mm. But I think we've all experienced that call that's saying to us, you know, that's there for you. And I think particularly as actors, it's about how do we do both? 
You know, how do we hold that space and show that it's possible for that person to get there even if they're in the middle of this catastrophic thing that's happening? So. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> well, there are two things there. There's first of all, somebody portraying, uh, an actor who doesn't have the illness, portraying uh, mental illness. I, I think that, yeah, you should have a professional in there. And most of the plays that I've ever been involved with, they do have a, either a medical professional or a therapeutic practitioner to come in and talk about the kind of signals and the kind of behaviours that uh, they can identify exactly what it is, first of all. Um, but the idea of actually getting somebody who's kind of bipolar to play somebody who's bipolar, I don't think that would be fair. Uh, I think certainly um, there, there are varying degrees of mental illness within the theatre profession. A lot of people are, um, I'd say a lot of actors are pro probably tend towards depression and introspection, and that is part of the creative process. Um, but I, 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 I think that's a kind of, it's an, it's an odd mm. uh, thing, really, because I mean, it's about like, oh, only people with bipolar disease can play bipolar characters, or only um, sort of, you know, I mean, it's going that way in casting, but then there's another side of it, where there's, you yeah, know, this gender fluid casting, where women uh, in the treaty done by Fish Amble recently, three of the male roles, De Valera and uh, Winston Churchill and one other were played by women. So it's, I, 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 as an actor, I would think I can, should be able to play everybody from the age of seven to the age of 90, and I should be able to play women. And in an ogle, I do that, all that, and the audience is okay with that. That's part of the art. And we, we just have to sort of ring fence the art. You know, in terms of practice, but be responsible about it. And yeah. I think I think it also brings it, which is a slight aside to what you're saying, is the self care that goes with that. Yeah. If I mean, we have we can't forget that every actor is a human being, yeah. and they have feelings too. They bring themselves. That's that's the mm. beauty that they bring to it. So there is an impact when you're when you're, um, I suppose, trying to portray a particular. Um, whether it's an, uh, an illness or whatever, it touches you as a human being. So it's also, how does, how does that actor mind themselves afterwards? Yeah. yeah. How do they, do they talk to someone afterwards? As in, it could be a friend. Mm. Um, go for a cup of coffee. I mean, we have a history of going for a drink. Mm. And that's an issue in itself. Yeah. So we, uh, we have a lot of things that need a lot of attention. We could, you know, as I say, this sort of um, is like a, a web. Mm. And there's a lot of bits attached to it. But it's about doing, doing simple things. Mm. It's doing simple things, but also the, the actors need to mind themselves. Yeah, they do. well, I was, we were just having this conversation earlier, and it was mentioned in one of the earlier forums about, uh, the title of it was, When Am I an Actor? And it's about being out of work. But when I started out in the 80s, and Dave, my, my colleague up there, I worked with him for over 40 years. When we started out, um, the, the lifespan of an Irish actor was about 60. Um, Donald McCann, one of the most brilliant actors ever, died in his 50s. Um, and then May, May Klosky uh, died in her early 60s, Ray McAnally died, and that was all entirely due to kind of excessive drinking, a bad lifestyle, due to, I believe, the stress of being an actor and not being able to really talk through the issues. Mm -hmm. So they have just, I, I suppose it was substance abuse, the only substance you could get was alcohol, but it's still a problem in, in this business and that actors don't look after themselves. And we have a responsibility as a nation to look after this resource. I mean, we ring fence Tara Hill, but we should also be putting some kind of, um, you know, resource around actors as well. And it's happening. And I mean, I, there are these charities out there who are just dying to kind of jump on board and say, of course we want to talk about this. And this is part of the kind of al alignment. But, but, it, but it is about, uh, you know, it's not just about portrayal, but it's about actually let's keep actors alive for as long as possible. Because, like, there was a great actor called Godfrey Quigley that Dave and I worked with on uh, in Whistle in the Dark, which is a, a great production that's kind of historically regarded as one of the best productions of it. But Godfrey Quigley was in that, and he was teaching us. He would give us notes. He was giving the director notes. That's because he'd had this experience. And that dies with an actor. Donald McCann should have worked for another 25 years, and all that experience is gone. Working with Donald McCann was like, he would take your breath away watching him in rehearsal. I used to go to rehearsal every day to watch him, even though I was only, I had, I was, I had a small part, the coal blocks guy who comes in and a furniture removal man. But, but to watch him, and that goes, so we're losing. It's kind of, we're, we're just eroding. All this talent is going. Like, like, basically, I'm older than most of the major actors that I learned from when I'm, when, when when I was a young man, they were all dead by my age. And is there not, we, I suppose that, and apologies, and I, I won't speak anymore then. No, there, no, uh, there's something around mentoring, like, you know, uh, having the elders, and I don't yeah. mean that in a negative, pejorative no. way, but there is a huge resource that could actually be helping the younger population yeah, as well. So having a mentoring, 
um, you know, because it is a very lonely game. And if you're going for audition after audition, you have to learn to the highs and lows of mm. going for something, thinking that you are really fit for this yeah. and you're not being picked. But the, may, the reason why you're picked may be not that you're not good enough. Yeah. It may be just that someone else is bringing something different. Yeah. Mm. Well, we just had a casting, the biggest casting, one of the biggest casting directors in the last forum, uh, Maureen Hughes, who talked about that very issue. But again, to say that, like, how bad she feels about not being able to give everybody the job. But she just says that, like, that you've got to stop thinking about it as a kind of um, looking for a, 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 an outcome all the time and look at more as a process. Yes. To say this is, um, over a year I'll do 20 auditions and I'll get four of them rather than I've got to get this job if I don't get this job oh my god this is terrible I'm no good and actually just treat it be more professional I think about it rather than just being um, a sort of a slave to your own emotions and and your own story mm -hmm. to actually make a collective story that they to say to everybody okay you're going to be an actor this is how it's going to go first three or four years uh, are going to be tough you might be lucky and kind of hit you know stardom but then you might find 10 years down the line that that it doesn't work for you anymore. So it's about actually just saying that, look, here's, these are the parameters in which you are going to work. These things are going to happen to you if you don't get the job. This, uh, and, and Marino Dwyer says, well, in between jobs, I'm preparing for the next one. It's about, it's about really paying attention. And as a sector, as a sector, we have a duty of care to each other always. Mm. So, it, you know, and, and in the room, we have a duty of care to each other and, and outward and outward. And I think that's really important mm -hmm. to, you know, and, but it's so heartening to hear that there are, are organisations like Shine that we can really go to and go, ah, OK, I'm stuck here. But, you know, there's, a, there's that, that personal piece as well, because um, to your question, you know, you were kind of saying about should there be a professional there? I think there's two sides. So there's one about the company that you're working with or for, you know, the, the duty of care there and the kind of things that they can do are like using um, the headline guidelines and like using those professionals and having those services there. But as individual human beings, regardless of if we're an actor or a doctor or a project sport, whatever the thing is that we do, it's up to us to say, well, where's my manual? You know, and I know that probably sounds funny, and the reason I say it is because when I started getting better, I had to do a wellness recovery plan. Um, and it was, it was writing all these things. What do I look like when I'm well? I don't know. I haven't been well in nearly 20 years. That's a, that's a fictional. But then I started learning. So, OK, so I'm really comfortable with what I'm like when I'm unwell. But then I started looking at all the individual bits. And the thing is, by the end of it, I had this 75 page document that was like a manual to Barbara. <laughs> and it was like, you know, I now know what it is. So, so really, to that point, it's about understanding who you are as a human being and knowing if I am going to do this. So, for example, if I put it in the context of if I was to do an interview, that's probably I'm, I'm not an actor and wouldn't even dream of getting on a stage in front of people. I'd be terrified. Well, so you're, the, you're doing it now. Well, the, the closest <laughs> I was going to say is, is just having a chat. So, so an interview kind of thing. So like that, I would go to an interview and I would say, OK, how am I getting home? If I've organised to drive, if something comes up in that interview and it triggers me or upsets me, mm -hmm. am I safe to drive afterwards? You know, is there somebody I can call? You know, if I'm really upset about something and I'm going home and I'm, and I'm feeling very heavy after it, What's the process? What do I do? Do I do I ring a friend? Do I ring my mom? If that person isn't there, who's the next one? You know, or is there something <coughs> I need to eat? You know, or maybe my energy gets really low. Maybe I know I need to drink more water, or you know, maybe I need to lift the phone and find out what services is. Maybe I actually need to ring the Samaritans because I don't have my own counsellor and I need somebody to listen right now, I just need to put it down. So those are the practical things that we can do. And I'm not being funny, but writing out that list and having it in your back pocket so that you don't have to think about it on the day. Because here's the thing, when we are thinking about these things, it's all great and whatever. When you're in the moment, and we've all experienced worry, in that moment, we forget those things. So having that list yeah. to say, here's my checklist. Actually, I'm OK, I don't need those things. I'm doing better than I thought I was. Or actually, that might help right now. Maybe a call to my friend or my partner, whoever it is. Or maybe my call, a call to my mentor. Maybe that's what I need. So those are the, the practical things individually, because here's the thing. It's not about waiting for somebody else. It's not about passing the blame or passing the responsibility and saying they should. It's about saying I should. I should do all that I can. And if they can do additional to support me, excellent. And if I get that support and I do this support, then we're golden. So it's about both sides coming. I think we need to start saying that we need to start talking about it. And the more we do, the more that, you know, we can 
<laughs> the more we can but talk Maureen about it. Maureen did say that, you know, because I, I suggested that Maureen, you know, Maureen said, yeah, if, if somebody's having trouble, they want you to be at your best. And yeah. so, and she admitted, said, well, you yeah, know, come back tomorrow, have a cup of tea. Uh, what what do you want, you know? And, and but part of the problem now is that, they, of course, casting is largely done by, on Zoom or else by tapes. And she's totally against that. She says, I don't want 100 self-tapes. What I want is five people who are going to be able to do the job and the director has to click with one of them in the room. So yeah. I think there's a movement. I mean, there's lots of things that are coming out of these forums, which is great for a, uh, but um, right. the w w one of them is, is that, you know, there, there are lots of, seeding, there's lots of other issues, but I certainly think that next year, if I can get more funding, panic attacks would be something we, we should address. Yeah. And then we get a bunch of people in, some a psychiatrist, a doctor, uh, and then a wellness practitioner can all talk about their, their perspectives and possible, um, you know, the reasons for, not a psychiatrist, because it's not a, an illness, but but he might be able to shine a bit of light but, on... Uh, yeah. uh, but I think the reality is it, it's normalising. I mean, I used to get panic attacks and I was doing singing and I had to sit myself down and say, do I want to continue? Do I want to actually fight this myself? So I, I totally get, and that's why I love to see people thriving. And I think the, the key to that is keeping the stress down. Yeah. It's, it's when you go, it's having, like the mentoring, it's if someone turns up and they're actually, they're really dysregulated or their, their leg is shaking like mad, just actually helping them find ways to be calm. Mm -hmm. It's okay. A panic attack is your system saying, I'm getting overwhelmed. Yeah. That's what it's doing. So it's about you don't continue and you don't need people panicking around you. And so sometimes people don't say anything because they think that others are going to make it worse. So and you can't you can't think straight. So you just need a way of finding ways to be calm. So I think I think that's something that needs to be normalised. Yeah. I think anyone who, especially if you're if if you're going for auditions, etc. How many people go blank? If you were to ask people genuinely, how many people go blank in this room? How many of you go blank when you're put under under pressure? Yeah. Like let's get real. <laughs> let's get real. Yeah. And that's that's a normal process. The body thinks it's in in fight. It needs mm. it, it's it's trying to protect itself. So I think it's about not ignoring it. And if if a, an actor is having a panic attack or whatever, to actually have a way of saying, do you need a bit of support? Do you need to take a bit of time out? Yeah. And the problem with acting is sometimes there's a strict timeline, you know, and so there's it's, a real it's, pressure involved in yeah. what we do for sure. So yeah. it's actually allowing people a bit of space and, and actually maybe afterwards to say maybe you, it would be good for you to, to chat to someone. It doesn't have to be a, a, a therapist. It could be a therapist, but it could be just a very good friend who knows you. Mm. will actually say, do you know what? You're really brilliant at what you do. You've got a that's a panic attack that can happen to anyone. As back to that collective responsibility, both as a like a, an industry and then in the in the room. If if the space is constructed, I think carefully enough, then you're allowed to say I'm having an anxiety attack or a panic attack, and I think that's really important. And it, I think that's getting better. That's yeah. improving. Yeah. I'm just conscious we've uh, a question here. Sorry, Maria. <laughs> so I just want to add, and it's in relation to what we're addressing now. I meant to say it at the beginning that there is an organisation now, Minding Creative Minds. Uh, which is a free um, facility available to anybody working in the creative industries that you can contact my Mind and Creative Minds about any issue and receive advice and support and mentoring. And that could be counselling if it's something that you needed or if you're having financial difficulties, housing difficulties, any element of your career and who you are as a creative working in Ireland, you can go to Mind and Creative Minds and actually their first session of 2022 is on Monday. Uh, it's online this month, but they hope to eventually be having in person. But Mind and Creative Minds is a facility that's open to anybody in the creative industries. Okay. That's amazing. It might actually be a really nice point to end on because I think, you know, something that we, like we've been kind of skirting around talking about is, is the fact that, you know, Ireland is twice post-colonial. We have so much collective trauma that we're so afraid to talk about stuff and we haven't been allowed to talk about stuff. We haven't been allowed to really properly collectively deal with things. And um, I just want to say thanks so much to First Fortnight for inviting us to have this conversation here in public that will be hopefully available online. It will be, yeah. For On the Irish 
Theatre Institute's thing. YouTube channel, all of the forums, uh, once um, we've kind of edited them down, um, will be, and, you know, put titles on. Um, Mark Canton is the, um, is the photographer and uh, he's been doing a great job. But there, there'll be avail- it'll be available in about a week's time. Um, so they, 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 it's a bit, of, a bit of a delay, but, but they are all available and they're there forever. Um, and that's the, the, the kind of the value of them as well, is that the, the people who can't make it or didn't know about it, that they can actually get, it's becoming a resource. Yeah. and a very important one yeah no it's amazing and it, I've had a, an amazing time I've learned so much and I'm so grateful to everybody here thank you for sharing all of this with us and can, um, can I just offer yeah. on the resources end as well from yes. the point of view of the learning from the stories um, a lot of our ambassadors have written articles um, and we also had a podcast series last year where a lot of our um, ambassadors came and told their stories and those are all available on our website that's on seachange.ie okay. seachange.ie so, and that's S-E-E like I see it okay um, and so if you want to hear from people who have those experiences even if you don't want to essentially reach out and sit one to one with them or you don't want to come to us those resources are there and in the same way we have a number of um, research booklets that are available for download I actually have a couple of copies here for the the people in the audience on our recent research around stigma and the general population responses to that but all of those resources are available um, on our website as well so and you just also released some media guidelines as well am I right yeah that's headline talking yeah so that's headline.ie so um, well we'll we'll include that information yep. plus uh, minding creative minds on the uh, yep. on the the next on this shine edition. headline sea change so yep. minding three, creative three minds. different websites just to be clear we are one family but we have three websites that's amazing thank you so much that's excellent it. thanks everybody thank you thanks for great thank you